Goedemorgen allemaal, Morweni, good morning. Uh, hartelijk welkom bij de ESB. Het uh, is lekker om je allemaal voor ogen weer te zien. Uh, my name is Piet Nogia, I'm the new director of the school. I've been in the office for about, I can't remember, 13 or 14 days. So this is my first leader's angle. Um, it's part of the business school's uh, uh, mission and aim to participate in public discourse of our things that are seriously important for our country. So we are academics who uh, do research. We uh, teach some of the top programs in the world in the school, as is evident from our accreditations. So if you do not yet have an MBA, you're stuck in the middle of your career. This is the space to come to. And there's still some space in our MBA classes next year. If you feel you want to rather specialize in development finance, we run a very successful 
uh, master's degree in development finance, which is so important for the <coughs> economies. If you feel you really want to help other people to sort out their own lives and marriages and businesses, you can come for our info in coaching. We work with uh, people more on one-on-one, -on -one, but also in organizational development. Uh, that was just an advertisement at the beginning, so. Uh, thank you, sir. We await your application. Thank you very much. Uh, this morning's topic is uh, very, very topical in any case, agricultural land reform. But uh, what is good about this topic is got a, a subtitle, which is not uh, often that you hear it, and only success case studies uh, from the Western Cape. Uh, and that would be good news, uh, because I think we, we as South Africans are really struggling uh, to cope with the uh, restorative justice that is required, but at the same time, efficiency and, and food production. We've got two presenters. Our program has just started, and um, the first is Dirk Kort Toski. He is from the uh, Western Cape Department um, of Agriculture. He is Director of Business Planning and Strategy. He studied uh, agricultural economics up to PhD level at Stellenbosch University. And um, according to his CV, he provides the scientific input into the policies that uh, the state development that we got. That's why we are going to play this here for often. There are come to a 20 minute talk. Um, and then we'll have our second uh, colleague speaking this morning, Mohale Sego Petsa from the uh, Mpopo province. He says he's not a refugee in the Western Cape, he's very here. How's that? So good to have you as well. Uh, already joined the Western Cape government in 2006, and at the moment he is the chief director of farmer support and development uh, in the uh, province. And he will uh, make a second contribution, after which I think both of you should perhaps be ready then, Mokale and Dirk, for a bit of interaction with the audience. We try to conclude here uh, by 8.30, maximum 8.45, so that you can also plan your schedules uh, accordingly. Let's give both of them a good hand and let us start. Eh? Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, when uh, last night, when I spoke to my wife, uh, she said she wanted to come. And so she asked what time is this presentation. So I said, no, it's at, uh, I must be here at 7 o'clock. She said, are you crazy? We will be here at 7 o'clock for a meeting. No. Well, thank you for being here. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, the reason that you are here is an indication that this is a very important topic. Um, so, at, at, on Monday, we actually had the provincial summit on land reform. And myself and Mughale at the bit, at the bit I said, okay, we will have about... 150 people. Mukhale said, no, we must prepare for 250. And in the end, there was 294 people that attended. And for the first time in a very long time, about 95% of the people stayed until 5 o'clock. And that was not because of the very good quality Asenberg wine we served afterwards. No, I think it was because of the, of the topic that we did. So this is a very important topic. Now, um, what, what we are going to do, uh, first let me just say what, what I'm doing. Uh, my title is Business Planning and Strategy. So what that means in practice, I get paid a lot of money to do all sorts of airy fairy stuff. You know, read a lot, write a lot, you know, think a lot and all sorts of nice things. And then I give the hard work to my colleagues, like um, Harley who is the Chief Director uh, uh, farmer support and development. So I do the nice stuff, my colleagues do the hard work. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that is how we, we proceed with the party. What we are going to do is, uh, we did our presentation in two parts. The one is, I'll say a little bit on why we are doing certain things and how we are doing certain things. Okay? So, and for that reason, I selected one specific project we've got, and that is the, the Boompi project. I don't know, you know, the tree project does, doesn't sound that nice, you know, like the Boompi project. So we call it the Boompi project. Um, and after that, uh, Mukhale will do a presentation on an external evaluation that we've done. 
it's one thing to say we must do certain things, but at the stage we said, okay, we are going to do an external evaluation by a service provider who was vetted by the presidency. So it wasn't, uh, you know, a service provider that we got uh, from here. It was an external service provider on a list provided by, by the service provider. But I'm not going to steal Mukhala's show. He will tell you what was the result of that. Um, what I'm going to do is basically, I think we need to start with a national development plan. Then I'll look at the Gwumpi project, and after that, I will reach certain conclusions. Now, we know that the national development plan, uh, the planning commission was appointed in May 2010, and their brief was to develop a vision for South Africa and to translate that <coughs> into a plan that, that, that can be implemented. Now, they were very prudent, and before, we started, before starting to work on the plan, they actually did the diagnostic. When you go to a hospital, to a doctor, you expect the doctor not to first write out the prescription and give you some pills, but you expect the doctor to first take your pulse and you know, look at your ears and stuff like that, to do a diagnostic, and that is what they did. And what they found was two main uh, uh, reasons why there was such slow progress. And the first was failure to implement policy. Okay. We, we've got a lot of plans in South Africa. You know, we've got stacks and stacks of plans. Quite often our challenge is the failure to implement those. And the second is the absence of good partnerships. And those two issues, we are taking forward in, in the way we address this. Okay, then they identified a number of primary challenges which I'm not going to address. Um, the NDP was released in November 2011, and the final document was in uh, uh, 15 August 2011, was handed to the president. There's 15 chapters of which a number of, of are of relevance to us, and uh, Chapter 6, an integrated and inclusive rural economy, is the chapter that is probably most relevant to us. And in, uh, okay. and in that particular chapter, the key elements in that chapter say the first is expand irrigated agriculture. Now, the reason for this is if, if you look in, in the Western Cape, about 68% of our agricultural products gets exported. That is a very high percentage of our products being exported. And the majority of those products are from irrigated agriculture and labor intensive agriculture. And if we want to make South Africa work, that is the area that we need to grow. Okay. So we should expand irrigated agriculture through water use efficiency and new irrigation schemes, which is a problem in the Western Cape due to our lack of, of water. Use underutilized land for commercial production. Now, underutilized land is also a thing that one can debate on. You know, when is land underutilized? But that's a debate for another day. And then support those industries and regions with the highest potential. Uh, job creation and, very important, creative combination between opportunities. Uh, combined opportunities, working together again is, is the theme. And then it put very much emphasis on land reform. Now, um, in this is uh, uh, table 6.1 in the National Development Plan, and what this table basically does, it say on the one axis, to industries with the highest growth potential, uh, and on the other axis, your industries with the higher labor usage. And ideally, this group, are the group of industries which we should select and support. Now, that does not mean that we should ignore wheat and uh, cattle and wool, etc. Because in certain areas, like in the Karoo, you cannot farm with the serious food in the Karoo. But you can farm with sheep and wool in that particular area. So we can't ignore them. <laughs> but there are very specific in, uh, uh, interventions there. And we should look at ways of moving uh, uh, wool production more in that direction to become more labor intensive. 
Now, the uh, example uh, we've selected is basically in this area, nectarines, plums, apples, pears, uh, those, those types of, of, of products. So this is the one thing that's in the National Development Plan. The other thing that's in the, the National Development Plan is that uh, about one million jobs jobs should be created in the agricultural sector. Have you picked that up? Okay. Who of you believe that is possible? <coughs> one person. Two persons. Okay. Who of you believe that agriculture is shedding jobs? Okay. Okay. The majority believes that. And as usually the majority is wrong. And I, I will show you now. Okay. <laughs> what, 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 the, what the National Development Plan say is that we need to create one million jobs. Uh, okay, it's actually 996,500 jobs that need to be created between now and 2030. Those jobs should be both on farm and off farm. Okay. Uh, not only in agriculture, but also off farm. Now, what's also important is that it is not only commercial agriculture that's supposed to do that, create that jobs, but also in subsistence agriculture, smaller than 0 0.5 hectares. Now, typically, in this area, you would include food gardens. You know, if you are in a an, an, an situation, uh, in a rural area, you know, or in the urban areas where you create an economic opportunity, that would be in this area. Your small holders between uh, zero, uh, between half and, and five hectares, bigger than five hectares, and redistributed land. In other words, land reform projects. We should make sure that land reform projects is, are efficient, and there's another about 100,000 jobs to be created there. Now, then the labor intensive winners, that, those that I've just shown, there's another 300 jobs, and labor intensive field crops. Okay, should, should make up the reminder. Now, the problem is, those of you that look at the statistics, you will only pick up this. You will only pick up those 250,000 jobs. Because if you look at agricultural statistics, those are the only people that would indicate they work in agriculture. So you can only pick up about a quarter. So that is, that is part of the problem. Now, um, in the Western Cape, how many of those jobs should we create? Uh, and what is important, okay, now if, if we say the Western Cape is one of nine provinces and that the, uh, we only look at the quarterly labor force survey, we should look at 30, we should create 30,519 jobs. Now, if you compare the labor force survey, the Western Cape agricultural data of the labor force survey, you will find that between 2011 and the latest one, which is the second quarter of 2014, 40,000 jobs has actually been created in the Western Cape. Okay. That is despite the labor unrest we had in 2012, 2013. Despite all those things, the uh, uh, agricultural jobs in the Western Cape province has grown by 40,000. So what this means is that we've actually reached our target and after this presentation, myself and Mukhali will go to the waterfront and we will have a ball of a day because we've already reached our target. Um, okay, the, the, the second one is that currently the Western Cape is responsible for 21% of the jobs in South Africa, agricultural jobs. So if we take that uh, percentage, then it is 74,000 jobs that need to be created. However, if we look at the whole total, of nine of about one million jobs and we have the same same arguments then it is about two hundred and five thousand jobs that need to be created so this is quite a challenge that we need to take and the way i know our hod and our municipal agriculture in the western Cape, they would not go for this target they would rather go for that okay so that's a little bit of, of the national development plan on the Boompi project Now, um, the, the, the Western Cape Department of Agriculture, for the past five, six years, we have actually been promoting partnerships with commercial agriculture. And what we've done is with a series of commodity organizations, we have established that partnerships 
and the support services to farmers are being done in conjunction uh, with those. Now, this has become known as a commodity approach because we are working with commodity organizations. And the Boompi project is an example of, or is a case study of one of these partnerships with the Decidious Fruit Industry. And the Decidious Fruit Industry is their representative organization is Hort Grove. Now, the purpose of this project is basically to expand the area under fruit production of previously disadvantaged producers. And those are both for new and established previously disadvantaged producers. Now, the new would be land reform beneficiaries, and the established would be current farmers in areas like Sauron, Fernandal, uh, you know, where you've got current farmers. Now, what, what, what is very important, and if you look at the National Development Plan, is those farmers should be linked to the market. And they should be able to participate in existing value chains. So, in other words, from the very start, the right cultivar must be planted. An apple is not an apple, despite uh, what people try to believe. An apple is not an apple. You've got various cultivars, various qualities for various market segments. So when you plant that tree, it, you must be sure that you will be able to uh, uh, harvest the right product. And the roles in this is that the industry provide the trees and the technical advice. Now, those of you who have ever worked in government will know if you go out on a government tender, the guys will see a okay, years opportunity to make some money. Okay, so we've got some dead trees there stored in the corner that won't grow. So let us flog that dead trees off to the government. However, if the industry, if uh, industry comes to a nursery, the, the industry will, will make sure that that nursery provides the best quality trees and make sure that the quality of the, or, or that the right cultivar will be planted. So industry provides trees and technical advice. From our side, we provide uh, the land preparation, irrigation, drainage, uh, trellising and things like that. And the commodity uh, project Assessment Committee, CPAC, evaluate each pro project in terms of the viability of, of each. Now, the CPAC consists out of officials from us, uh, from industry, and some other various role players. So together, each project are being evaluated. Now, since 2009 to 2012, over those four years, uh, we've established uh, 300 and close to 313 hectares of fruit trees. Now, the cost of establishing one hectare of fruit trees ranges between 150 to about 250 rands per hectare. Uh, but I've calculated an average, and that average is basically depending on the type type of trees at the cultivar, etc. I've calculated a weighted average to make this easy. So that is 178,000 uh, Rand. And so the total value of investment over those four years is 55 million Rand that has been invested in, in this project. Now, we know that the cost of one job, uh, go back to em employment multiplier, um, and uh, for the deciduous fruit industry, the cost of one job is 190 <coughs> Rand fixed investment to create one particular job. So in, um, in that 313 hectares, 470 jobs has been created okay, towards achieving this target. Now, Hort Grow contributed 13 million of that 55 million in terms of what they provided in the trees, in the services, etc. From our side, we've contributed 10 million, 10.66 million from our CASP funding, Comprehensive Agricultural Support Package. Not going to go into the technical detail, but that is a particular mechanism that's available for us to fund this type of project. So the total support is 23 million, or just below a half, and then your other partners, in other words, in your, your beneficiaries themselves, in terms of sweat equity, labor, etc., and certain strategic partner contributed the balance of, of that. So from our cost, from cost, it's uh, 30, uh, 34,000 uh, 34, rand per hectare. Uh, and for one job, it's 22,000 rand per, per job. Now, where the average job would be 119,000 rand to create one job. 
in our case, it was 22,000 rand to create that uh, capital investment for, for that one particular job. Okay, now this is just a map on where those projects are. And you will see that it's evidently it is distributed more in the fruit producing areas of the province and some in the uh, claim karua also. And okay, this is just trees. If you would look at the other commodities, you would find a better distribution in other parts of, of, of the province. Okay, now if, if one look at, at the efficacy considerations, um, we established. 313 hectares. If we used that 10 million rand cast money, we would have only established 40 hectares. So by working together, as the National Development Plan asked us to do, to create partnerships, we could establish almost eight times bigger area. Okay. We created 470 jobs. We would have only created 90 jobs, which is five times more. So, uh, so by working together, you create much a much better scope. Uh, okay. The net present value. The okay. When you plant an orchard, you will only expect a full bearing orchard in seven years. Okay, that makes it very difficult to to evaluate the success rate at, at this stage. You will you will have one hundred and seventy eight thousand rand expenditure now for the next two three years. You will have more expenditure. You will get start getting your first harvest, harvest in the fourth year and full bearing in, in seven years. And after that, you would have an, uh, a full bearing orchard for the next 25 years. Now, you would uh, know you are all with a business school, so you know, all know how to calculate net present value. Now, if we calculate the net present value of that cash flow stream okay, per year, then we say that the net net present value per year out of this project is 25 million rand. That is, and in addition to the economy, okay. for an investment of 10 million rand over a period of four years. So this is this is good science. Okay. If we spend that 10 million rand on our own without working together, we would have only had a cash flow stream of about five million rand. Okay which is half of, of the total investment. <coughs> so, um, if that 10.6 million was invested in, okay, we have talked about the Gwumpi project, in general agriculture, it would have been a different picture. But if we use that 10.6 million in manufacturing, we would have uh, created a cash flow stream of 12 million, uh, employment of 32 <coughs> versus 470, and exports of 1.3 million versus 11 million. Uh, so you can go down to construction, well, so electricity, etc. So, in terms of investment of money for government objectives, I think we've got the winning recipe here. Okay. Now, just in terms of conclusion on, on my particular part, um, through this partnership, we could have established a lot more jobs and economic potential than if we wanted to do it on, a, on our own. Uh, we would have only created 19% of the economic stimulus than if we did it together. Uh, the, whole, uh, the whole idea of creating partnerships, of working together, cre are creating dividends. And through this partnerships, we could have placed our previously disadvantaged farmers on a much bigger and on a better trajectory. Okay, now this is long-term crops, so evidently we couldn't evaluate that. Okay. But we've done the evaluation of all land reform projects, all land reform projects that we supported, and uh, on that part, my colleague Mukhale will will do the presentation. Um, Um, just hang on, let me just... Let's do it at the end, at the end, yeah. Let's see the whole picture of the presentation as well as the evaluation. Okay. Yeah. Here you go. Can I just watch microphones? Yeah. Okay. 
you have any questions or ask questions at the end? While my colleague is being wired up, can I just, just one additional item I would like to put on the table? Uh, we are provincial department of agriculture. Now, those of you that look at, uh, 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 as investigated the constitution, will know that agriculture is a dual responsibility of national and provincial government. Land reform is the exclusive responsibility of the national government. So what that means is we cannot spend money on purchasing land. Okay? If we spend money on purchasing land, then we will end up on the front page of the song, and you guys will say it is uh, misappropriation of funds and we are wasting funds. So we are, we are not allowed to do that. However, once a person has got land, then it is our mandate to support that person. We support it to, uh, for instance, in the Bunti project, but, and, and also as Mukhali will explain now, the results from, from that evaluation. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Derek's challenge was from his wife was whether there would be anybody here at seven o'clock. My challenge was the fact that I'm actually on leave today. And my wife was actually not impressed with the fact that I said to her, I need to be with you guys this morning. So we both had challenges, it seems, from, from our, our better house. Right, my, my presentation is around the land reform evaluation. <coughs> this is a matter that South Africans generally don't necessarily want to talk about uh, because of the negative perception out there, you know, that says uh, land reform projects have failed. And I think we are here this morning to say to you, not according to the facts that, that we have within the department, now, where did this, this, this whole thing start? In 2009, when the new minister, Minister Gerard van Rensberg, then uh, was appointed, he then said to us, he want to be remembered by the sector as a minister that pushed land reform. And he said for us a target, he said he wanted to see at least a 60% success rate over that particular uh, term of office. And for us, this was a tall order because at the time, we also believed what we are fed out there, what we are told about, about you know, how land reform is a failed project and, and so forth. And the evaluation then was based on a population size of the 246 projects, which were supported by the department during the same period. And that was 1st of April 2009 to the 31st March uh, uh, 2013. And these are projects that are supported by what Derek referred to CASP, which is a comprehensive agricultural support program, and the Lima Letima grant. This is purely conditional grants that the department receives from the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, specifically for the land reform uh, projects. Now, that was basically the population size that, that we looked at. But as management, we, we, we had to look at defining success. Because minister said to us, you need to ensure 60% success rate. And the issue for us was, what is success? We needed to define success. And this is how we define success. We define success in the following five indicators. <coughs> the first one, we wanted to check whether these are legal businesses, you know, whether they comply with your SARS and, and labor laws of the land. That, that was the first one. We thought that would define success for us. The second one was to establish whether these businesses had business plans and to what extent the business owners themselves were intimate with these particular plans and, and how often were these updated. We, th we thought that will, will actually uh, be a signal uh, to success because those of you that understand the land reform space quite well, you would know that a number of them, the business plan that they have, is the one developed at the point of acquisition of land and nothing then happens after that. Uh, and obviously you would know that a business plan is a guiding document we need from time to time to be updated to, to take cognizance of what is happening. Now the third point we, we thought would define success for us was 
whether these businesses had access to markets. And in this particular one, we didn't limit ourselves to the domestic markets, but also looked at the international markets. We thought that would be a signal to a business that is, that is successful. The fourth one was the extent to which these businesses kept records. That is both the production records, your sales records, and so on and so forth. We needed to check that. We thought a business that has such records, you can actually be able to gauge whether there's progress in that particular business or not. The last indicator that we looked at was the extent to which the business owners themselves would reinvest part of their, their, their profits back into the business. Now, we, we thought to ourselves, this is how we define success. And when we went out to appoint a company based in, 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 in Pretoria, as, as Derek already alluded to, which was a, on the list of companies provided to us by the presidency, we, we, we gave them as, as the indicators. You go and test this and tell us whether these businesses are actually doing what, what, what they're expected to do. This was, and I must qualify, it's a performance evaluation study. Now, this is the approach that was followed, the six-step process with the project initiation up to your data collection and your land reform project success report. Um, these are steps that we actually followed uh, undertaking this particular study. Now, in terms of sampling, 164 projects were sampled uh, from the 246, and, and this was a representation of the the district spread, the municipality, and the size in terms of the number of, of beneficiaries. And in that particular sample, 10 of the projects that were sampled, we found that they, they closed down. Uh, 10 were actually closed down for a number of reasons. Uh, some were possessed, some because of uh, conflicts within those groupings, they could not move. And some farms were lying fellow and nothing was happening. This was only 10 that, that was in the sample. This is a map that shows exactly where the sample was uh, in terms of, uh, you know, their locality in the province. And you'll agree with me that this is a good spread. Uh, it covers the entire province in terms of where these projects uh, were located. Now, in terms of the evaluation framework, three key dimensions were looked at. The first dimension is a dimension that looks at the economic productivity which is a dimension that really looks at the income, the debt, the expenditure, the production that is happening on that farm, and issues around business planning and market access. The second dimension was the dimension that looks at the socioeconomic factors, because we thought the business can thrive and do very well, but if the quality of life of those that are working in the business is not improving, that is not a success. So that was the second a particular dimension that we looked at. The third dimension was the dimension around environmental issues. To what extent uh, are these farmers or these businesses taking care of the natural, the, natural, the natural resources? So we thought that was that was an important uh, dimension to look at. And in total, this business was subjected to a total of the nine indicators covering these particular uh, dimensions. Now, 11 of the sampled projects uh, were actually immature. In other words, they they were delivered on land around 2011, and it was almost impossible to gauge whether there was there was you know any success at that time. They they actually had started functioning in 2013, and we thought that was a, a challenge there. But 17 of the sampled projects were into the category of what we refer to subsistence farmers, and therefore we couldn't subject them uh, to a criteria of market access because in the main, that may not largely be the, the, the undertaking there. It's more issues that has to do with, with subsisting. And therefore, these 70 were rated uh, separately, not within uh, the entire, uh, uh, you know, the criteria that looks at market access, productivity, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of the indicators, I already alluded to the fact that they were subjected to 39 indicators, and 56% of those particular indicators was around issues of economic productivity and 13 percent environmental issues and 31 percent was actually looking at the socio-economic factors now we in terms of the classification used and i mean the university here and i think the colleagues understand the the percentages 
73% to 100%, those that scored between that particular range, we define them as highly successful businesses. And a business that scored between 53 and 72%, we said this was a moderate success. 33% to 52%, we said it's a challenged project. And obviously one that's between zero and 33%, we said, no, this is a failed project. This was actually the classification that we looked at to be able to tell whether there was any success or failure in the process. Now, this is the project rating system. All those are the indicators uh, under the economic uh, productivity. It was your business formalization, expertise and management, market access, production, income, expenditure and debts. That was basically the, the particular, I mean, the, the indicators that we looked at under the economic uh, factor. Under the social, economic and environmental, you see the, the impact on the natural resources, the labor law, the quality of life, issues around empowerment. These are all the indicators, the nine indicators that these projects were actually subjected to. Now, in terms of the highest scoring indicators, the first one, this is the top 10 in terms of, uh, uh, out of that 39 indicators. The first one that is called the highest is the fact that a number of these land reform projects had the ability to service their own debts. And ladies and gentlemen, this does not agree with what we have heard every day about the performance of land reform projects. 88% of those had the ability to actually pay uh, their own debts. Now the lowest scoring indicators, here are they. The percentage of farming electricity from renewable energy or green energy, it's, it's called the lowest. And the change in regularity and consistency of income up to 40%. Now these are the, the lowest uh, indicators that scored uh, uh, the list in terms of the 39 indicators that we referred to. Friends, this is the slide when I was reading the report from Kaimani Development Services, I was looking for a slide like this. I, as I was looking for the report, I was actually looking for the results because I couldn't wait. The report is 150 pages and I said to Derek, Derek, I'm not sure I'll be able to read all of it, but let me quickly check what the study says and I'll therefore read the rest of the report. The report says, ladies and gentlemen, in the Western Cape, based on a population of 246 projects, there's 62% success rate. And that for us was something that actually says, uh -uh, besides what we are told every day, the reality is this that 62% of those projects where we are involved uh, are actually successful. And with the 8% that is challenged and failed. Um, and this is basically the results that, that we witnessed in this particular study. And of course, it will be expected that as government, we will celebrate the 62%. But let me tell you where we come from in the Department of Agriculture, we actually are concerned about the 38%. And therefore, we're making plans to address the 38%. Our issue is not the 62% per se, but it's the 38%. What do we do that we don't end up with the 2% that is failed or challenged? And therefore, if you were to get access to the improvement plan, we're beginning to address issues around how do we make sure that we do not have 62%, but maybe we have 80 to 100%. So the 38% for us, it's an important factor as we plan uh, going forward. Now, in terms of the classifications there, you will see that the environmental dimension that actually performed the list uh, is the one that performed the list. And we are beginning to say as a department, because it must also be understood that we are not farmers, we don't farm, but we are involved in the business of changing behavior of farmers. And therefore, through the extension services that we give to farmers, we are beginning to say within the department, we need to build issues around environmental messaging to farmers because it cannot be about production, markets, producer gain, and markets. So we're beginning to build the issues around environmental sustainability into extension messaging. And therefore the study was quite useful for us in terms of what do we need to do to address uh, the issues going forward. Now I thought I must show you this slide because this slide summarizes the entire study. When you look on all failed projects, this project said no market access contracts in place, all of them. That was the first thing that jumped uh, from, 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 from the beginning. 
they had no operational loans. They actually had no loan to, to worry about. Uh, there was no skills development plan in place in most of these businesses. They received no mentorship. Uh, 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 that's, that's basically what, what, what was happening. There was no change in terms of the access to food and ability to feed their own families. That was another indicator that was actually uh, seen to be common among the failed projects. But if you look on all successful projects, they, these were legal entities. You know, they were registered businesses, they were they registered for VAT, tax, and they also had uh, a bank account. Uh, and they complied with labor law, ladies and gentlemen, which if you look at the 2012-2013 farm worker strike, um, uh, the, this project that we supported, they complied with labor law, which suggests to us that the compliance with labor laws is not something that is limited to commercial agriculture only. In other words, smallholder businesses are actually complying with, with, with uh, the labor law dispensation. So this was uh, an interesting finding uh, for us. But also they had uh, market access. All their produce were actually uh, destined to, to, to set markets. But importantly, these businesses kept the records. You know, in terms of the production sales, in terms of the yields, there were good records in this in this particular uh, businesses. Now, few recommendations were made, and uh, because of time, I've decided I'll only show the four. Uh, the one recommendation was that we needed to support uh, the formalization of businesses. You know, because if you look at the failed projects, none of them were registered. So we are needing to start supporting our farmers uh, to the extent that they will uh, become formal businesses. Uh, my colleague Derek Trotsky showed a slide, uh, table 6.1, around the number of jobs. Uh, that will require these businesses to become meaningful players in the market, in the formal market. And it's almost impossible to supply your world with your spa, your pick and pay, which most of our farmers are supplying without being formalized. So going forward, this is something that that we needed to strengthen. And for your information, we have a unit for technical assistance within our agency, Casidra, and this is where we're going to have to bring more money and strengthen it, that uh, we encourage farmers to formalize their businesses. But the other recommendation was that we need to use more of our uh, economists uh, in terms of where the planning of, of these uh, businesses. And, and I think this is something that internally we're beginning to say uh, we needed to have our program, Agricultural Economic Services, coming to the table in terms of how we plan this, this particular businesses. The third issue was the issue around the business planning process, that we need to consider developing a unit that will assist farmers in putting together their plans and so on and so forth. And we said to uh, ourselves, this is probably something we will not do because there's a unit already. It's probably to strengthen that unit and make sure that farmers are aware of that particular unit and they make use of that unit. The unit is at Casidra. It's a two-man <coughs> show, a unit. It's a virtual uh, unit where upon we call upon its experts to come and advise us on issues that we're not able to, to deal with. The fourth issue is around uh, farmer support and development officers, these extension officers, that they are not trained on issues that are to do with conflict resolution and so forth. And, and this is a reality. <coughs> Because, and we are the university here, because the degrees that are offered to, to students, for instance, I, I, I came through that process. I was never taught extension. And when I graduated, I, had, I was expected to give advice to farmers. I have a degree in animal science, but there was no extension into it. And therefore, it's a challenge for us that we needed to start training our people in issues that has to do with extension and conflict, conflict resolution and so forth. And this is what we are doing already in the department. Now, in conclusion, we think this success is linked largely to the commodity approach, which Derek had referred to earlier. We think we would not have been able to achieve this success had we not partnered with commercial agriculture. And I'm quite happy that a number of faces here present are people that are partners. They are partnering with us and we are moving agriculture forward. Clearly, government cannot farm and government has not farmed. We need business, uh, we need the industry, to partner with us to be able to do that. And we think this success is largely to the partnership we have with commercial agriculture. We we'll provide mentorship services and provide links in terms of market access and so on and so forth. But I also thought 
Uh, lastly, I must indicate to you that there was a separate study uh, on the impact of the comprehensive agricultural support program that has just been completed by the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, which has largely confirmed the results of this particular study. And I think you will have that not very long from now because I'm aware that it will serve in, in Parliament and not long, it will be a public uh, document. And that result, which was done separately by another uh, university, it was University of Pretoria that was commissioned to do that, Professor Charles Machete and the company, they actually undertook that particular study and largely they confirmed the finding of our own evaluation in the province. Let me say here, with that said, thank you. Thanks very much for giving me so far. There can be further there in the front. Uh, we've got 15 minutes. That's good time. Thank you guys for allowing us a bit of space. You can come and stand closer to me. I'm going to dance. You can direct your questions wherever you want. Number one, number two, number three. So, so you are and which I can say the eye um, I'm with Mitchell Federal Assembly, Agri Manager of the Secret. Um, you said on the Bumpy project, you started in 2009 and you planted 52.9 hectares. Then you increased from 2010 to 100, just over 108. And then it started to decline. 2011 it was 93, 2012 it was 58. Why was that? And, yeah. and um, uh, the figures for 2013. Yeah, that's, that's, that's. So we take a number of questions and then we can respond. That's a very specific factual question. Okay, so perhaps you should uh, okay the, the answer to the answer to the question is very simple. Uh, the the resources from Horkra, uh remember they they've got a statutory limit and part of that statutory limit they are our reference for, for this type of project. So they they basically depleted their part of, of, uh, of the fund. So if they could uh, generate more funds, uh, or if we could generate more funds from another source to supplement what we can put on the table, we can basically maintain that. Uh, and the 2013 data uh, is available, but this is based on a paper I've written uh, before that data <coughs> Yeah, I'm Nepo Mumaro. Uh, I teach for the University of Telford Business School. I uh, have a question for the first presenter. I was really impressed with the kind of the success and the quantity of the job created. But then I was just curious to know what the composition in terms of farmers job, part-time job, and whether they are seasonal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, evidently, when one talking in, in agriculture, you will have uh, seasonal jobs and, and permanent jobs. Uh, the information I've used is the best available uh, employment multipliers, because it's not only on-farm jobs, but it's also jobs around the value chain, which would include packing jobs, etc. Et so one could roughly say about half of those are permanent and, and half would be seasonal or seasonal job equivalents. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, job, seasonal jobs, but in job equivalents. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm always happy to see familiar faces after the summit. Uh, talk again, thank you very much for, for awarding us this opportunity. It touches me to say 19 years ago, in 1995, I was doing postgraduate diploma in organizational management at UCT. I'm now taking it down. I'm now taking down the memory lane, saying that one professor told me, probably sometimes we are gifted differently. You've got ideas that are 15 years ahead your South African scenario. However, one question for you, Dr. B. Why group B? I thought you'd give me some flesh on that one. The other one is I've got here. Oh, by the way. I'm representing Njongo Pami Farming Cooperative in PAL, and it will combine you. 
you drawing the success stories and the failures. I'm so impressed. And I could see some gaps. Because one of the things I do in my line of business voluntarily, I'm unemployed. I'm able to detect the limitations and transform them into opportunities. So those are the things I've seen. Here, ladies and gentlemen, I've got an evidence document of the CASP scenario. It says here, CASP approval of funding declined for period April 2008-2009. 2009 March, and I'm looking at CASP, I see the effectiveness of, of CASP started just after we were declined, which is now 1st April 2009. Now, where I'm getting at is, I'm wondering maybe why Mr. J.T. Theron, who was writing this to us, who was also so kind to say, having declined our application, we would like to see you to discuss your application. And I'm linking it to Mr. Muhammad to what you said. Part of the things that were not given to us in our education was the extension services. Now I could see and draw the figures why there was a failure in our application. However, my father here, Chief Kagata Gala, who's my chairperson, has been in and out and has been failed by the very same processes we put in place for eight years. Since 2006, when we signed this common age lease agreement with the Dragon State Municipality. Till today, we have never been happy. Now, I'm looking at the situation whereby could it be perhaps, again, a question that you must consider, when we do our own employment as a Department of Agriculture, it is now high time and necessary that we introduce a very little <laughs> element that South Africans are not applying, vetting and screening of our officials. It's very critical was I would fail to understand an official so passionate about agricultural development could fail people like him, not coming forth with examples or maybe with alternatives that suggest that, look, Papa, you might have failed this and that. The idea is not to fail them. The idea is to empower them. The last one, Doug, the partnership. The question I'll have to the floor, because I like everyone, not only you guys, but everyone must answer. Guys, when you are here, who should advocate these nice words of community private public partnerships? <coughs> who should advocate this black economic environment so loud about? And then when I take Mr. Theron here as my friend, then I'm called and Frankie. Mm -hmm. Now we had a situation where in our lease agreement, a clause, I think it's clause number six, which I'm contesting with the Prada State Municipality. I've got Mr. Peter Castings next to my father, able to say, Mr. Gallup mm. giving you 100% cost production support. The municipality says, no, there's no other person either than yourself here. Now you go to the summary policy, policy summary talk, that reads as follows. <laughs> Utilize agricultural <laughs> economies to investigate potential for viability of projects. The nice line I like there, it says to ensure that beneficiaries are not set for failure. This is a certain example of a set for failure. Come the end of product, uh, just to end, come the end of the, 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 the argument. On the 2016, we will be told you failed. Why? You didn't have an ability to utilize the land. Did you guys understand the questions? I was a bit. Yeah. I think we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, uh, 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 is it all you Yes, yes, please respond. Right. Um, thank you very much for the question. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I haven't got the facts in terms of the project in question, uh, but I can assure you that uh, there is solid criteria that is applied in the department, uh, and I'll be wrong to then make a statement that every applicant will be approved, uh, because the cake we get is just that cake, and obviously it cannot cover the the needs. I mean, we we have a budget of 160 million. And I think the 2008 that you're talking about was probably 80 million or less <coughs> at the time. Uh, and our needs are actually far above that. So maybe the best thing to do is to probably engage with us and uh, that we follow that correctly. But from what you are saying, I get a sense that the municipality is also involved and the lease contract becomes an issue. <laughs> One of the critical uh, issues within our selection criteria is that there must be a sound security of tenure and if there isn't such a thing we will not be able to use your money 
to invest on somebody else's land on your name. So it's, it's, it's something that we probably uh, together can, can follow up. Your second issue around the vetting. Yes, I want to tell you, yes, it's happening. Uh, I'm vetted, Derek is vetted, and a lot of the stuff that we appoint go through that particular process. In fact, we never issue an appointment letter unless that is done uh, in, in the Western Cape. Thanks. <coughs> Let's just add two things to that. Just in terms of the Wumpi project, uh, well, it is basically, uh, you know, the tree project. Uh, of course, it's this particular project focused on fruit trees. You know, so that is where we have Wumpi come from. But, but can I just, there's one thing that myself and my colleague do not agree on, and that is what to do with that 38% of fellow project. Um, I, I think, uh, or at least the 11 percent which yeah are, are totally fine. yeah you know one thing in south africa we haven't got right and that is to celebrate failure yes if if you look at donald trump okay, he's one of the biggest hotel magnates in the world but he has failed five six seven times and every and, and he's never been and, and he had the ability to go forward okay. in South Africa. If you if people go out and farm and that project doesn't work, we tell the people you are bad people. Go and sit there in the corner and we will never again touch you. Okay. That that is that is our approach with pilots. We, we should allow people to exit the system with dignity. And then at another stage, come back into the system. Because that is the way that people learn also, you know, through past mistakes, etc. And we haven't got that culture in South Africa to celebrate failure. Two hands. There are three days. One, two, three, and that will be seen at the bottom. Right. Thank you. I'm Walt Smith, uh, Center for Business and Society at USB Executive Development. If I can take the license for two quick questions. Um, the public debate is filled with uh, the discourse around 50 percent or 12,000 hectares and so forth and so forth what we hear here is a different story which is a which is an, uh, an emerging story almost from the bottom up and as much as it's been driven by a department but it's also a bottom up story what is happening between what's happening in the province and happening at a national scale because the sound is so radically different. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems as if there is a change management approach here that we need to learn more about. That's the one. The second is the backroom story. It's great to see uh, the statistics, the numbers, and so forth, and the policy framework. But very often when, when we hear stories about land reform and success stories in agriculture, it's the stories of a solemn delta, or a story of a spear, or a backsburg, and so forth. I want to know what's happening in the back room where the real partnership, which is the more tricky one, the one between a farmer and laborers, or yes. uh, the, the commercial farmers and the small farmers, where those conversations are taking place. So what is being done in order to promote, <laughs> facilitate, and create the space for that conversation, because I think that must be core to the success here, um, in a sense. So I, I'm interested in what's behind the numbers. Any questions? Okay. Okay. That? I, I will start. I, I, I think, uh, okay, uh, one fortunate thing about South Africa is that we've got nine province, provinces. So, but, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gives us the scope for experimentation. And not, uh, uh, so we can experiment with certain things, and if it works here, yeah, it can be replicated. Uh, there are certain things that uh, uh, we, we, we've, we've just done the Flyer project, uh, which was a project which started in the Popo province. And they did it there first. So we, it worked there, and we replicated it here. So I, I think because of, of the system, we can experiment and see things work and not work, etc. Now, politics sometimes models the process, you know, but I think there are a number of officials not clear-headed enough to, to understand this. And interestingly enough, at, at Monday's uh, uh, 
uh, uh, summit we had, Mr. Masapuna Mbongwa from the Department of Rural Development was very excited about the discussions that took place. And so we provided him with all the information. So we think that <coughs> is, that information will filter through to the rural development and what is happening there. In, in terms of the backroom discussions, you know, what I, I think one thing that is coming out very clearly, and what the National Development Plan also say is that uh, the, the NDP is a, is a document for all South Africans. It is not a government document. So what is being said about land reform, we as department cannot do everything. I, I've made, you know, I, I like what they call Sunday afternoon songs. You know, I sit on Sunday afternoon in the sunset with a glass of wine, look at Stellenbosch Mountains, you know. Then I do all sorts of creative calculations. Now, what I've done on the Sunday afternoon is that it will, for South Africa to reach the 20% target in the Western Cape, to reach the 20% target, we need 2.1 billion rand per year to purchase land. Okay. Now, for all government sources, we've got less than 400 million. So we are sitting with a big, big challenge there. So what it tells us is that actually from a private business perspective, I think there's bigger scope or the, or the, the need to become more engaged. <laughs> And that is that is where your solos dealt us and those guys come in. Because they they are private entrepreneurs who saw, okay, listen, there is something that needs to happen within my range of objectives and what I see must happen for the country, I am taking the step forward. So don't wait on, on government. So I, I think to a large extent, yes, we explain what you can do. But I think there's a big scope for private individuals to take the next step also. We have two hands. I'm going to ask you to ask both your questions and then we conclude with that as well. First, you sir. First of all, I'd like to thank the speakers for a very interesting presentation. However, what my main question is, there seems to be no logic in what you say. Looking at the uh, reasons for failure or the slow growth of South Africa. I think you left out the most important one, which is that the basic policies are wrong. If you look at nowhere in the world has an emphasis on sort of agriculture to sort of create an economic growth. It's been the opposite. Extensive farming gives more to the productivity than low level intensive farming, which you're advocating now. If you now look at what is happening in China and Vietnam and all the countries in India where you're getting economic growth, it's not coming out of concentration on, on sort of agriculture. It's coming out of manufacturing and software. <coughs> India's getting not growth out of putting more people into farms. <coughs> people are leaving farms. People are going into the cities to get jobs in IT and manufacturing. What we, we don't need more partnership with farming. We need Samsung to come here and create 100,000 jobs. We need Apple to come here. We need Foxtel to come here. This is how we're going to get growth in this country. Not by, uh, if you can give me any examples anywhere in the world where you're getting growth in the basic economy and in, and in employment from in concentrated so agriculture, I'd like to hear them. Thank you. Failures, reasons for failures. I think something has been missed of that. I'll say one, you put their extension officers, you know the value of money, not the value of the crap. Mm -hmm. If I'm a little man, I mean, you, 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 please uh, bear with me, it's my bad news, whatever, I can't break it. Those people speak it. There's the food is today. There's a generation of uh, generations upon generations of on the ground. Why take such people and put them, make them extensive officers? Because they know the value of the time. Secondly, the mistake which is being done by this government. <clears throat> this government, a person like me, I'm talking particularly about the place where I'm coming from, Pal. Anyone will now witness what I'm taking that say here. In Pal, we have got 25 years doing this subsidiary farming. 
We have never been even helped a cent by the government. That's the cost which was restricted by the government. But if you go there, in the past 25 years, we have got our pigs, we have got our cattle, we have got everything in place. All the government does, new entrants. If I can tell you a story here, if I can. There were these MK guys who were given an up and running farm in park. Mm. And Mr. Sima, who was the chairman of those groups, came to me and said, Mr. Gala, we've got a problem now with that farm. I said, now you, you, you have just come here for ten, uh, 10 years doing this thing. Why, why problem in the farm? You have got everything, government, everything. He said, what happened there? You will never believe Mr. Gala, the story I'm going to tell you. We had a group of LK guys, 50, we given this up and running farm. We had a foreman there who was a good guy there. And we made him our, uh, to be a foreman there. All we did, we came from the townships where all people of the chances, we come there only on Friday and pocket the money and go to the waterfront. Monday we come again. He said, at the end of the day now, Mr. Gala, in the trouble with the SPCA. They have consultated the beds and we are in trouble. I say, why? He said, there's no money to buy the feed. I say, why? He said, one day I came to the farm on the money and I asked this woman, where are the eggs? There are no eggs on money. Mm. He said, you never believe this, Mr. God. But what did the farmer say? He said, the farmer told me that me, Mr. Simon, the professor from overseas, all those guys, the farmer told me that the chicken don't lay eggs on them over the weekend. They must rest. <laughs> <laughs> Even the up and run farm would believe that story. <laughs> Telling a man who has never been helped by the government who's ever seen himself. Again, after that, there were three new entrants. They were given 200,003 groups. Chickens, again. <laughs> Today, we won't see even an egg there. But we have been there, and we're still there today. There's no help. Why does the government don't look for the threat record of these people who are there and help them better than these new entrants that the people are just talking about? Thank you very much. Perhaps you should answer the question of the assistance and on what basis, and perhaps that you can conclude on the question of economic growth. Right. Thank you very much for, for the question, Babuka. I, I, I think from where, where I'm seated, I agree with you uh, that the chickens are not only live over the weekend, <laughs> they lay eggs. You, you made mention of the Mfundis, uh, which happens to be a chairperson of one of the commodity project allocations committee, the grain uh, commodity. Uh, there's a policy in South Africa that dictates as to who should be appointed where. If Mfundisi wants to come work for us as an extension officer, Mfundisi will be looked at. Uh, uh, provided Mfundisi qualifies in terms of the norms and standards of extension. But what we do, acknowledging the, the, the value that Mfundisi brings to the table, we make Mfundisi our partner. He is very much involved in what we do. We must also believe that our young extension officers need to be mentored and, and, and coached. And the likes of Mfundis seated there and Carl Opperman here and a number of you that are partners with us and Jerome Topley, your job is to motivate and coach and mentor these young extension officers to the extent that they are able to, to give you the advice that is necessary. Derek made a mention of the fact that the beauty in South Africa is that we have nine provinces. The other beauty in South Africa is that uh, we have a Department of Agriculture that is responsible for support. We also have a Department of Land Reform which is responsible for settling people on farms. And this is not done by one department. So the issue of land, it's not an issue that we can answer ourselves, but we can answer here about progress on the settled farmers, because those are the ones we, we interact with. And this was clearly a performance evaluation, not a design evaluation and issues around policy would have been captured there if this was a design uh, evaluation. Thank you very much. Just on, on, on that question, that's that's actually a three beer debate. You know, so we are not going to solve it within the next five, five minutes. 
our area of responsibility is agriculture. And I know there is a lot of people that say agriculture is a dying sector, it should not be supported, you know, support can be much more efficient uh, elsewhere. Um, however, I think, not I think, I know that agriculture do have a very particular role to play within the economy, particularly in the rural economy. And what we currently have with agriculture cannot negate it. Uh, yeah, just a simple calculation. We've got about 200,000 agricultural jobs, on-farm agricultural jobs in the Western Cape at this stage. How many jobs are currently in Saldana Steel? How many, and, and the, the skill requirement in Saldana Steel, how does that fit to our population uh, 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 abilities? So we must also be very careful in uh, uh, trying to create an idealized situation without us necessarily having the, the, the luxury of, of taking it. <coughs> yes, there's a lot of problems. Okay. So that's a part of the debate. To our discussion today, <coughs> we, we cannot speak on behalf of the rest of the economy. We can only speak on behalf of agriculture. And that's our area of responsibility. So what we are doing within our area of responsibility is to say, okay, given this, what is the best way of getting this area of our responsibility right? And and that is what, what we have been trying to do. But I mean, that is a debate for another, it's a three-year debate. Thank you. Our time is up and it's my uh, pleasure to um, thank the speakers. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us. I think all of you would agree uh, that it's a wonderful story. We are all now informed and also thought to um, tell the story also on their behalf. We would like to wish you well uh, with this endeavor and um, we would like to have you back here and tell us more of um, the success story. So thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.